And just a reminder that Ephesians is the church in Ephesus. That's the, all the people who live there, Ephesians. Paul is writing from a prison cell in Rome, and he is, uh, it's been about five years since he has been there with the Ephesians. He spent about three years with them, and they are in a very, very pagan culture, about 500 miles from Jerusalem, very different from 500 miles in our world. It was a completely different world to them. They, they knew nothing of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew nothing of this Jesus that Paul came and taught them. And so these believers are coming out of a very pagan, very erotic um, lifestyle into a life of Jesus. Um, the, the worship of Artemis or Diana was the central focus in this pagan culture. It was a very erotic worship a lot of temple prostitution and all that stuff that you had surrounding that and uh, that um, that goddess and the worship of her. And so these Christians come into a life called by the Lord through Paul and they know that they've been born again and they're like, okay, this has been my life, now what? My life has been very different from what I'm called to here and so what do I do with that? Uh, not only that perspective from their pagan worship, but also how do I live life with my kids, with my spouse, at my job? How do I do life? And so that's that's those questions that Paul addresses uh, in Ephesians in this letter to them because they were really wondering. And so he's discipling them remotely uh, through this letter. So on your handout, you'll see, very important for us to keep in mind, write this down. Paul is writing to believers, not unbelievers. He's writing to believers. And again, that's very relevant because they have been rescued from a pagan lifestyle. And now they want to know how to do life. So he gives them some advice. He gives them some words inspired by the Lord himself. Chapter 5, verse 1. He says this, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Rather than being imitators of the culture around you, be imitators of God. That's a good word for us, isn't it? It's easy for us to imitate the culture around us, to kind of play along. But we're not of this world. We're passing through. We're strangers in a foreign land. And so, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Skip down to verse 10 in chapter 5 trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. So how do we do that? Of course, we do that through the Word, the sword of the Spirit, as we learned about. And we, um, like he was encouraging them, trying to do what is pleasing to the Lord, walking in His ways, not the ways that they've been accustomed to. How do you do that? Verse 18 in chapter 5. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that we got to this section, and he was encouraging them because um, debauchery and drunkenness was part of their culture. And he's telling them uh, that even though that's been part of your life, there's something else you can be filled with that is much more satisfying, and it will leave you uh, much more fulfilled than that other uh, lifestyle. So what does a spirit-filled life look like? Verse 21. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Be subject to whom? To one another. Husbands serve wives. Wives serve husbands. Children obey your parents. And we're going to get into those things specifically. Verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then verse 25, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Two very heavy, tall orders. But without verse 21, it's going to be hard to do. You've got to remember, 21 usually comes before 22, right? <laughs> In most math books. Not sure about Common Core, but it does come before, before verse 22. So be subject to one another. If we have an attitude of humility and service to one another, the following verses aren't that tough because we know that each of us is serving each other and we're serving the Lord by doing that. So that's part of what the spiritual life looks like. Then we get to chapter 6. And so what we're going to do today is, as you see in your handout, some closing thoughts. Ephesians 6, in the first uh, several verses there in chapter 6, we've gone through this before, but some things that we didn't really emphasize when we looked through it before, just as a conclusion, 
to our study in Ephesians chapter 6, just verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The children of these believers in Ephesus were believers, not because they went to Sunday school, not because they went to vacation Bible school, not because they went to a church service and heard the gospel. They were believers because their parents shared Jesus with them. That's why these children were believers. So he starts out in chapters, well, in the chapter at the time, in this part of his letter, uh, the chapters and verses are pretty later, but in this part of his letter he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. You are in the Lord, for this is right. Yes, sir. You need to change the batteries on your mic. Oh, okay. We're changing the batteries on the mic. There's a problem. Is on here? We can't hear you on the broadcast. Yeah, just bring it up. Let's see if I can talk Give me a thumbs up if he says it's good. All right. Good, good, good. So, children, obey your parents in the Lord. If you look on your handout, you want to write down, younger children are expected to obey parents. This was specifically for younger children. We'll get to the older children soon, but this first one, specifically. Now, again, Younger children meaning children at home versus adult children. That's the difference we're going to see. Younger children are expected to obey their parents. Why? Well, two things. You want to write down, it's not on your handout, somewhere on your notes, you can put this. Number one, because it's right. <laughs> it says obey your parents and the Lord because why? It's right. What's the, what's the result of children not obeying parents? Well, it's anarchy in the home. What's the result of anarchy in the home? It's anarchy in the culture. In the community, in the town, in the city, in the county, in the state, in the nation. It goes, starts with the family, goes out to the society. So children must be taught to obey. Because children don't inherently, we as humans don't inherently know what is right. And the second reason that children are expected to obey parents is... It's how the children learn to obey the Lord. It's how children learn to obey the Lord. When children learn obedience in the home, they then know, okay, they can transfer that over to the Lord said that, I'm obeying that. It's a good habit. It's a good discipline that has been instilled. So it's how they learn to obey the Lord, and it's how they obey the Lord. When a child obeys mom and dad, or mom or dad, then that child is also obeying the Lord because the Lord said, do this, right? So it's twofold. The result of a child who's been taught to obey, from parents especially who fear the Lord, is that child will then obey God because it's right, not because they want to. Because God will often lead us down paths that are difficult, and he calls us to obey even though we're on a difficult path, a difficult season. And if we have learned to obey because he said so, or because he brought us to that point, we learn obedience from our parents, we will learn obedience from God, not because we want to, because it's right. Because many times we're led down paths where we don't want to go down, yet God says, I got you. You can trust me. So a very important lesson for parents to instill in their children. The word obey there, you can see, I'm going to try to pronounce it, it's on your handout. Hearken or to be obedient to. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching from Proverbs 1, verse 8. 
Children obeying parents is something that we see most often in Christian homes because of the principles that are laid out in the scripture. But one of the marks of the last days is seen in 2 Timothy. And I put that verse on your handout as well. In 2 Timothy, it says this, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive. And then it says disobedient to their parents. Well, children are always disobedient to their parents. What do you mean? What was Timothy getting at? What was Paul getting at when he wrote this letter to Timothy? Why did he say disobedient to parents is one of the marks of the end times? It's because it will be amplified. It will be at an exponential rate. It will be more evident in society that children are completely throwing off the conventions, the disciplines, the teachings of parents, and going and doing their own thing, going their own direction. In fact, we've already begun to see that the government and children are now teaching parents to obey. There is a state on the left coast, I think you know which one I'm talking about, and they are considering, they're considering uh, penalizing legally parents who don't affirm their children's identity, that that would be a crime. And so that sounds like it's complete opposite of what the word says here, which of course sounds like the enemy, that the enemy wants to turn everything God says and flip it upside down. So, however, Teaching the children to obey is a really, really good idea that we see in, as we continue to read. Verse 2 in chapter 6. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And I'm sure there are probably some dads who've used that verse. <laughs> you want to live? You'll obey. <laughs> So this is, this is speaking specifically to older children. So you want to write down, older children are expected to honor parents. Older children aren't necessarily expected to obey parents, especially if those parents don't know the Lord. The older children can say, you know, no, that's not really how we run things in our family. You know, I'm not called to obey you. I am called to honor you. So respectfully, I need to say, no, I'm not going to obey that mandate you just gave me, mom, dad, whoever, right? But honoring mom and dad is, especially as they get older, taking care of them, making sure there's means to take care of them, making sure there's a place for them so that we can um, make sure that we are honoring them that way. Honoring them with our words, honoring them with respect. And... Um, some of you may have not had the best role models as parents. Some have wonderful parents and you want to honor them. Some of you may not have had great parents. But as believers, isn't it a great witness to honor and respect someone who wasn't really respectful to you? The Lord can use that. Again, I don't know all of your stories, but all of us have an opportunity to honor our parents as long as we have that relationship with them, as long as they're with us. So, let's break this down and look at this verse in more detail. The word honor there in your handout, temeo, to honor with reverent service, to treat with honor, manifest consideration toward, to be considerate, to be considerate. I like that, again, the word respect, that, that to me that's, that encapsulates a lot of that definition. So this verse is saying that if I'm not considerate to my parents, I'm really not honoring the Lord. Honor here doesn't mean obey, like I said. But then the verse says this, so that it may be well, or so that it may turn out well for you. And I put that in bold letters on your handout, in caps, so that it may turn out well for you. The word well in your handout, you see, to be well off, to fare well, to prosper. Who doesn't want the blessings of God on their life? Everyone does. And so part of that is coming through honoring those who have taken care of us when we couldn't take care of ourselves and blessing them because they blessed us. And again, some, some as best as they could, right? 
But in those situations where what is not an ideal situation, maybe even a very difficult situation, what a great witness it is to come to those parents and honor them, respect them, let them see Jesus. And maybe if they don't know the Lord, maybe they would even come to Christ through that attitude. So what is the result? You want to write down, God promises to bless those that honor their parents. He said there in verse 2, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Deuteronomy 5 says, honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you're, you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. This verse, way back in the Old Testament, is so important that God had it repeated six times. I'll get the references there below that, Deuteronomy 5, on your handout. Repeated six times in the New Testament. When something is repeated, we know that it's important. It is so important. He had us see it again and again through the Gospels into even right here in Ephesians. That it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And fathers, verse 4, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I want to go back, and you, you see on the top uh, right-hand side of your handout there, pater familias, that's Latin for the father family, uh, father families. And the that you can look it up, you can look at it later, but that explains and describes the Roman Empire and the influence of the Roman Empire in these uh, cities and countries, in Asia Minor here where Ephesus is, the influence of them in those cultures and the pagan culture that they were in, it's awful. Let me just give you a, a cliff notes, a little spoiler alert before you go look at it later. Um, for example, the dad in that culture had supreme authority. So much so <clears throat> that he could beat his wife or his children and have full support of the community. It was not a secret, it was well known they got our line, they were beat. He could fly into a rage with no consequences, and everyone in society would approve because, well, they must have gotten out of line. You can fly into a rage, no repercussions at all. Studies have shown that anger is a control mechanism, and it gets submission in the people that get blown up upon. But it does not change hearts. So it is detrimental to the future relationship between a child and his or her parents. So Paul says, that's not how we do things as believers. That's not how we do things. Instead, he says, on your hand out, you right now, teach them. Teach them. So right above that, you see something from verse 4. It says, bring them up. And this refers to the training years. So you want to write down the training years. Bring them up refers to the training years. You fathers, provoke, exasperate not your children. This is from the literal version. You fathers, pater, provoke, exasperate not your children to wrath or resentment. But bring them up, ectrefo, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We'll break that verse down. So bring them up refers to the training years. Bring them up. A trefo is to rear up to maturity. To bring them up to the place where they can be healthy adults who know how to interact, how to have healthy relationships. So during the training years, Colossians 3.21, provoke not, irritate not by vexatious commands, unreasonable blame, and uncertain temper. It says, lest they be discouraged. That's from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. 
So all of us can relate, perhaps as parents, to moments that we have lost our cool. We can relate as children to when our parents have lost their cool. So Paul is coming alongside contemporary believers and the believers of the first century and saying, that's part of the old life. That's something that, that if there's woundedness there, if there's pain there that you've experienced in your own life, the Lord can heal. If it's a behavior or an action, if it's, if it's an attitude or even a habit uh, that is tolerated in, in the home as believers, that's not how believers function according to the Word of God. So, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So instead, I have you right now, teach them. Nurture and training is tutorage, education or training by implication, disciplinary correction, instruction, or nurture. Why do children need to be trained? Children need to be trained because they don't know. They've never been down this road before. Yeah. They've not lived this life. They've not faced that challenge. They've not felt that way before. It's, this is new to them. They're learning. And so parents must teach their children so that they can learn because they've never known how to react in situations, how to do life. So secondly, that's number one. So instead we are to teach them. Number two, in blank you can write there, speak life. Speak life. And in our home, we are very intentional about this. It's right above the word instruction there on your handout. Speak life. We are very intentional about this. We encourage our children. We tell them, you can do this. We can tell them, you can do all things through Christ. We even put it in the context of Scripture. Uh, we avoid any kind of, oh, you did it again. Oh, this is just, okay. I can't believe. What's your problem? It's, you know, we, we build them up. We encourage and, and with our words, speak life to them. Our words are seeds. And those seeds will be planted in hearts and they will reap a harvest. Either a harvest of good behavior and a healthy life or a harvest of bad behavior and an unhealthy life. Well, some of, my, some of my words as a parent, you know, they've been good and some have been bad. We'll continue to pray and, and take this message and take what God is, where he's got you right now and go to where he knows, where you know he wants you to be. And so if the Lord has, has um, you know, brought you to a place or through a season where you think, you know, I've planted some rotten seeds before. God can totally heal that relationship. He can go in and take care of that. So don't be discouraged, but be encouraged. As long as you have breath, the Lord can heal in those wounds. But from here on out, speak life. Because our words are seeds and they will reap a harvest. So again, the word right below speak life, where you wrote that instruction, admonition, is any word of encouragement or reproof that leads to correct behavior. So it's our words. Our words are powerful. Our words are powerful. And look, April and I don't always get it right. Our kids, I'm not going to give them the pulpit right now, but they can tell you. <laughs> we don't always get it right. <laughs> but what we do, here's one thing that we do in our home. We don't say I'm sorry very often. What we say in our home is, would you forgive me? Because I'm sorry is... I'm sorry, and I've got a lot of remorse, and I really did something wrong, and I said something I shouldn't have. And the other person feels worse than they did before sometimes. But I believe when we say, would you forgive me? That other person has a chance to forgive, and both hearts are made right in that relationship. So when we don't get it right, when we do say something, or cut a look, or just, you know, the sigh, the parental sigh, then many times we'll have to go back and say, would you forgive me for that attitude? Would you forgive me for those words? And um, we also encourage the children among themselves to do the same thing, to make peace with each other. We say that a lot in our house. Okay, you guys need to come here. You need to make peace. 
as the blessed are the peacemakers, right? Not the peacekeepers, because our house with eight kids, it's not very peaceful sometimes. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but we make peace when there's strife, when there's war, when there's conflict, we can make peace. And blessed are the peacemakers. So uh, we do that a lot in our house. So speak life and make sure that um, another thing that we do before I move on to the next section is very different. And that is that we don't let the sun go down. We try not to let the sun go down our anger. And that's between April and me, and also between the kids and themselves, and between us and the kids. Sometimes while we're there, we're doing prayers and singing before we go to bed, I'll say, okay kids, does anybody need to make peace before you go to sleep? And usually there's a silence of about 30 seconds. And then somebody kind of sighs and said, okay, <laughs> would you forgive me for da 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 you know? And it's so good for their hearts to then sleep so much better. Their conscience makes a soft pillow. It's not in the Bible, but it's a good one. Um, <laughs> so so it's, uh, it's good to make peace with one another, especially before bedtime. So we speak life to one another. Our parenting goal is that one day when our children are grown-ups, that those adult children will want to come and hang out with us when they really don't have to. And that's really kind of the social aspect of our parenting. We want them to like us enough when they leave that they don't have to come back by coercion or by guilt. But they want to come out and hang out with us. But there's also a second aspect, and that's the spiritual aspect. Another goal that we want our children to know is that they they know God and they have a vital relationship with Him. So there's two dynamics to our parenting uh, that we reinforce frequently uh, in their lives. So, a little insight in our little home. Let's go to the next verse. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in the sincerity of your heart as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will rendering service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters, do the same things to them and give up threatening, knowing that both their master and, capital M, their master and yours, Jesus, is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. This section is kind of a precursor to how Christianity changed the world. The world at that time, in Athens, there were 75% of the population were slaves in Athens. In Rome, 50% of the population were slaves. And they were um, an integral part of society. Well, Christians came along, and wealthy Christians especially would buy slaves in order to set them free. And they could do that. They could say, okay, I bought this person so that now they are free. And it became kind of a thing that Christians became known for that. But not only that, in the church itself, they saw much liberation. So I've got your hand out, then and now. In verse four, pardon me, chapter four of Luke, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor and he has sent me to proclaim release to captives. And that's not only captives to sin, I believe that especially in the world, in the first century Christianity, there was a great move among uh, the people of God. So to be taken by the sword is what it means to be a captive. To be taken by the sword, some would be killed and some would be made slaves. So again, Christianity was born into this world of slavery. Also in your handouts, you see Colossians 3, verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. In the early church, slaves and free were equal. 
And at times, you would go to a church service, and there would be an elder in the church, like a deacon, or someone who's kind of a, a, an office, if you will, a position of authority, in that they were serving others through their spiritual gift, right? They were serving others somehow as an elder, as a deacon, and they were formerly a slave. Or they may have been currently a slave. And then in would walk another member of that fellowship, and that would be the master of that slave, and receiving counsel and wisdom from God from the slave. What a beautiful picture of God turning that just completely right side up and seeing there's level ground at the cross. But how many of us have been taught this, that Christianity actually endorsed slavery? It is true that there were nominal Christians. You know what a nominal Christian is? A nominal Christian is someone who identifies as a Christian, <laughs> but isn't really a Christian, <laughs> if you're tracking with me. Okay, there were nominal Christians who endorsed slavery, but just because someone identifies as a Christian doesn't make them a Christian. Just because I identify as something else doesn't make me that something else, by the way. Are we on the same page on that one? Okay, good. God doesn't make mistakes. So if someone says, I identify as another gender, they're saying, God made a mistake. So I'm going to get it all changed. At the end of all things, in all time, there will be some who will come before the Lord, and they're nominal Christians, who perhaps carry the banner that is being waved today, and say it's loving, it's right to um, validate someone in the way they feel. Those are the ones who don't see anything wrong with that. That Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. But, but I know you, Jesus, because I'm doing things that are good and right and loving. But he says, no, no, no. It's not about you knowing me. It's about me knowing you. And for someone to truly know Jesus is also someone who is known by Jesus. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. And there are plenty of nominal Christians just like there were back in the day of those who said slavery is a good thing, it's in the Bible, and da 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 Those were the so-called Christians by name only. So history books are accurate in the saying that Christianity and Christians promoted slavery? Yeah, they're accurate in that. But did the church? Did the true body of Christ? Absolutely not. So just to straighten up a little history for us there, uh, to make sure we're all in line with what the word says and what the truth is, Jesus said, just because you have that label or church membership or whatever, doesn't mean you truly are a child of God, truly are born again. So, write this down below the box there. Employees, serve your bosses like they are Jesus. We can put it in the modern context of employees and bosses, slaves and masters, right? How do we show Jesus to the world when we go to work? Well, you don't know my boss. <laughs> it might be the... Might be the thought that comes to your mind when you when you hear that. But if you serve your boss like they are Jesus, they will notice. And the Lord will notice. Remember, we talked about children obey your parents and the Lord for it is right. Well, we are to obey our bosses because it's right, because the word says to. Verse 7 again, with goodwill, rendering service as to the Lord, not to men. So you want to write down? Work like I'm serving Jesus. The literal version, verse 5. Servants, kudos, be obedient to them that are your masters, kurios, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, respect and fear, in singleness of your heart, 
as unto Christ. Verse 8, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. So you want to write down, God will reward faithful service. God will reward faithful service. And then verse 9, Masters, do the same things to them, and give up threatening, knowing that both their master, again, capital M, Jesus, and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. The cross changed everything. Everything. That's why the church is a picture of heaven. That's why when we come together, there's level ground. There's not this conversation about, so tell me about your pedigree. Tell me about your resume. Tell me, you know, no, we're all in Christ. And masters, so the last one you'll write down, employers treat your employees like they are Jesus. So it's the same thought, right? Masters, treat your slaves do us the same way without threatening them because you know that both their master, Kyrios, and yours is in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Over in Colossians 3, verse 23, we have this verse on our refrigerator. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Even if you have an unreasonable boss, even if they ask things that are just silly or busy work or whatever, what if Jesus were asking you to do that? I want it, Lord. <laughs> and that's not to get points with Jesus. It's to be a witness to your boss. And it's to show them the love of Christ. And especially for that person in that position, Respect is a big deal for them. And so they see that respect. And whether you mention Jesus or not, they're seeing Jesus because you're serving them as if they are Jesus. So they're seeing that deference, that love, and that respect. So that's where we're going to stop and uh, conclude Ephesians until next year, <laughs> maybe a few years before we get back to it. So let's all stand and uh, let's pray. And just as we're before the Lord here, considering what he may have shown each one of us, be open to his still small voice. Perhaps it's that we need to make peace with someone. Blessed are the peacemakers. Perhaps it's that we need to change our attitude at work and to be a blessing instead of being difficult. Perhaps it's to forgive a parent for past shortcomings and failings. Knowing that parent loved us the best they knew how, but had issues. And whatever it may be, Lord, we bring it all to you. And we submit to your authority in our lives. We yield to your Holy Spirit that you would love the world through us. Because we truly may be the only Jesus that some people ever see. Lord, I thank you so much for this fellowship of believers. I thank you for their love for your word, their love for you, Jesus. And I pray you keep all of us till we meet again. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.